When I was a young girl, I thought I was an alien from outer space. My dad, who was an Olympics gymnastics coach, had been recruited to come to New Zealand to train the New Zealand gymnastics team. So with his four young daughters under 12, I was the youngest. We came to Christchurch in the 70s. We were the first Taiwanese family. We had 120 US dollars, and we didn't speak English. I felt like a Martian. My mother packed us fried rice, which we ate with chopsticks at school. The kids called us names. We were told to come to an event and bring a plate. So we did, <laughs> six of them for every member of our family. I remember the first day that we were in Christchurch. Mum and Dad were trying to sort out the house, so they said to us, go to the park. And we caused a car crash because the sight of four girls, Chinese girls holding hands in red silk Chairman Mao suits, for some reason, was not a sight that you usually see crossing the road to Hagley Park. And so all my life, I've had people yell at me and say, you should go back to where you came from. And I inculcated from a very young age that actually being a migrant was not a good thing, and being Chinese was not a good thing. But that was last century. And so when I think about the 21st century, I have realized something. I have realized something that I want to share with you today, that actually the future has now come to meet me. And that in the 21st century, when you have two key megatrends, which is digital disruption and globalization, that all of that practice that I had starting at the age of six makes me Malcolm Gladwell's expert. In the 21st century, it isn't enough to be smart. And in the 21st century, it isn't enough to have EQ in the 21st century when you are being disrupted and it's quicker, faster all the time. You need to be able to adapt. You need AQ. That's the adaptability quotient, the ability to adapt and thrive in an environment of change. And AQ isn't enough because you need to have CQ because the second key megatrend is globalization. Now, I'm in a good place to talk about this because I am standing today in Auckland. And Auckland is the fourth most super diverse city in the world. So what does super diversity mean? It means a country where 25% or more of the people are not born here and where there are 100 and more ethnicities. I know that in Auckland right now, in less than 500 working days, one in three people in this city will look like me. Yes, it's true. The Chinese are taking over the city. <laughs> and also, I know, yes, let's, let's have a round of applause. It's really true, the alien invasion. Uh, the other thing that I know is that New Zealand is the fourth most super diverse country in the OECD. So, you want to recruit those customers, you want to target those clients, you want to be able to manage your talent pool and understand what attracts those staff, then you need to have cultural capability. So AQ and CQ are the new IQ and EQ. And I confidently predict that in five years' time, when people are recruiting, they're going to be looking for people who are smart and who've got EQ. But the thing that will distinguish them is the fact that they can adapt and be flexible to any sort of change, and that they can work with anybody not like them. I would like to say that I'm the first person who has had this amazing thought. But actually, there's a, a little-known chap called Charles Darwin who kind of said it better. He said it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. But I am the one who today, for the first time globally, are telling you about what I consider to be the migrant effect. And this migrant effect is the powerful difference between adapting to cope and adapting to win. I think this migrant effect, which forces people who are otherwise marginalized and different, whether due to ethnicity, or sexuality, or ability, or disability, to adapt to the mainstream, have had more practice than everybody else at being disrupted. And so they've had to force themselves to confront uncomfortable things and change. 
And so as a consequence of this, they can use that to win. And so can I just have a show of hands? How many people here were not born in this country? Whoa, look at that, the overwhelming majority of the people here. Who here has been marginalized because you're either indigenous or because of your sexuality or you have a different ability? Oh, okay, so what I'm trying to say to you is that in the past, you considered this to be a weakness. You, like me, tried to hide this because you thought it was something that you shouldn't share with everybody else. Well, I'm about to tell you that that is completely wrong. This is your superpower, and I'm going to make visible the invisible. The invisible was that we pretended that we weren't these weaknesses, but I'm telling you that you need to shout it from the rooftops, because this is the migrant effect, and it is hardwired. Now, this is my next point. If you want to continue to win, you have to throw a rock at a tiger. I have discovered that if you throw a rock at a tiger, then you have to run. <laughs> and that's the motivation that you need. Now, I just told you about the first tiger in my life. I didn't throw the rock, my parents did. We didn't have a choice, we came to this country, and when I got really miserable and stopped eating and got anorexia because I was not happy in this country, they couldn't take us home because we didn't have enough money to go home. So we had to stay here and we had to make the best of it. And I vowed and declared then that if we were going to stay in this country, then I was going to make something of myself. So what is a tiger? What is a tiger? You see, a tiger is different in everyone's lives. I can't tell you what a tiger is for you. What a tiger is for you is not for me, and what is my tiger is not your tiger. A lot of tigers in there. But what I'm trying to say is this. A tiger is something that is a point of no return. A tiger is something that puts you under pressure to change, because change is uncomfortable. A tiger is something that makes you have to run faster, dig deeper, be more resilient, be brighter, get yourself out of a corner. This ability to adapt has to be so good, otherwise you're going to get eaten, okay? So all I can do is tell you examples of my own tigers, okay? So here we are, aren't I cute? I'm the little, I'm the little cute one at the end. This was us in Taiwan. Uh, you know, my parents, who are both elite athletes, taught us to swim, so we were all swim champions. And, uh, you know, the way my dad taught me to swim is kind of a bit like a tiger. He'd throw you in the pool, this happened at the age of three, and just before you drowned, he'd put a rope around you and walk you up and down like a dog, you know? <laughs> but, but that meant that I was a very good breaststroke champion before I came to New Zealand. And then, of course, this is us in New Zealand, and there's my father, wearing his New Zealand blazer, and my lovely mother. So this is hardwired in me now, so figure out which one I am. I'm not the Maasai, okay? <laughs> Can I just say that this photo was taken at 6 a.m. in the morning before it got too hot in Kenya last Christmas. We were in the national park and my Maasai had a tattoo which signaled that he had killed two lions. And he had to run with me because there were lions in that park. And I just want you to know that I couldn't hear him, and you could hear me. I was going, <gasps> and you couldn't hear him at all. He was running along, and he was soundless. But anyway, I was determined to beat him <laughs> when the photo was being taken. So what I discovered is that this migrant effect becomes hardwired. You get used to having to adapt and change, to being awake all the time, uh, and to being resilient. So I want to tell you about my tigers. OK, this is my first tiger. So I come from a family of academics. We were always in education. I was the youngest senior lecturer in law in New Zealand at the time. My mum and dad desperately wanted me to be the youngest law professor. But I quit. I quit, and I decided to go and set up one of New Zealand's first boutique law firms and Australasia's first public law specialist firm. That was a tiger because I had no idea what I was doing, but I wanted to know whether or not I was any good at practice. I wanted to know whether I was any good at business. And so the dean said, well, don't quit, just take leave. 
But I knew that if I took leave when the going got tough, I would just crawl back to the law faculty because it was easier. And thank God I quit because it was really hard. I think I managed to lose $80,000 in the first three months by signing the wrong lease for our premises. But it got better. It didn't get easier, but I got more practice and I got better. And so I didn't have a choice. We were out there, I'd mortgaged the house, we had to run. And the good thing was that over time, we succeeded. But then 20 years on, what happened was I fell asleep. Soren Kierkegaard is a fantastic Danish philosopher. He said, the trouble is, we are all asleep. And so I was, padding my way to the office every day, practicing a little law, going home. We were doing fantastically, and I was so bored. And I could, because I was fully adapted to my new environment. So I realized that what I needed to do was I needed to wake up. And I thought, the only way to wake up is to find another tiger and to throw a rock at it. So I said to everybody, I'm going to Auckland. And they said, you're mad. You can't go to Auckland. You're a public lawyer. You're a constitutional lawyer. You have to stay in Wellington. And I said, watch me. And that was five years ago. So I went to Auckland. And at the same time as I went to Auckland, I did another thing, which was throwing a rock at a tiger. I thought to myself, after 20 years of being a serious lawyer and trying to pretend that I wasn't Chinese, because I didn't want to be stereotyped and boxed in as a lawyer that kind of did tax for Asians, I never talked about it. I just pretended I wasn't Chinese. And I just want you to know how hard that is when you look like this, all right? <laughs> so I decided that I was going to speak out about super diversity, because here I was in the fourth most super diverse city in the world. And I came out as a Chinese person. I set up New Zealand Asian leaders. Uh, I came out as a Chinese person. So if you didn't know, I'm Chinese. And if I'm not for me, who is for me? And I'm proud to be who I am. And I don't want to be made to feel that that is a bad thing. Because what I have learned is that it's part of my superpowers. It's part of what makes me, me. And so I set up New Zealand Asian leaders, and we brought together all of New Zealand's top Asian leaders, and I set up the Super Diversity Centre, and we wrote the Super Diversity Stock Take, and we gave it out to everybody, and we had 145,000 downloads in the first year. And I set up Super Diverse Women because I realised there was an emerging market segment. If half of the market in Auckland are Māori, Pacific, and Asian, then the client base is a quarter super diverse women, and they had a different experience from everybody else because that match between gender and ethnicity meant that they were constantly underestimated. So that'll be the title of my next TED talk. And then after that, I decided I needed to throw another rock at a tiger, and I'm, I'm kind of almost done. I, I wanted to know whether or not I could do this startup thing because it looked kind of cool, but I didn't know whether or not I could do it. And investing seemed like not throwing a rock at a tiger. It seemed like giving jelly meat to your pussycat, right? <laughs> so I thought, no, we're going to do this. And so, look, I don't usually do wills, but I just happen to have a very, very super rich, super powerful CEO client whose dad died, no will, complete mess, because they were so wealthy and they had so many assets. And he asked me to attend the family conference. And so there we were, all these lawyers around the table, everyone arguing with each other. And I had this out-of-body experience. I was watching my own family arguing about the proceeds of my estate. I had died. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I went and looked at the stats. People weren't making wills. And so when I got home, I realized my will was 10 years out of date. And I realized that humans are the only body that knows that they're going to die, but acts as if they never are. And so I discovered that death was the ultimate motivator. So I created mybucketlist.co.nz, and this says, come make your bucket list, think about what it is you want to do. I took the whole fiduciary services industry online. I said, why do we need to have funny bits of paper that you scroll your name on? Why can't we make wills online? The great thing was Perpetual Guardian bought it, and they've done amazing things with pushing that out in the UK and the US. This is my latest, myadvice.legal. This is a legal 
matching market. You're going to say, why is that a tiger? That doesn't look like a tiger. How is that a tiger to a lawyer? Let me tell you, that is a total tiger to me. I have now been doing the law for so long that I deserve to rest on my laurels and sit in my office forever, charging a very high rate to fix your stuff-ups. <laughs> but I realized that I was a digital immigrant because I was born, as my son would say, mum was that last century. I was born last century. I was not a digital native. So here I am, sitting on the BNZ board, talking about being a digital bank and being disrupted, but it was all bullshit. I didn't know anything about it, because I wasn't a part of it. So I thought to myself, law is not like selling sneakers, but law is about customer service. And the more I talked to people, the more they hated dealing with lawyers. You know, they're too expensive, they talk gobbledygook. When you say, I don't understand it, they say it to you simply and then charge you $3,000. You don't know who's working on your file, they never ring you back. It's kind of like, you know, is this a privilege for me to be giving you all this money to give me legal advice? So I decided that I would set up myadvice.legal and create a market. And to be credible, I put myself on that market. I didn't have to, but hey, you can't start a legal market and then not put yourself on it. So I put myself on it, I put Chen Palmer on it, and that is a rock at a tiger, because I'm now running a digital company, so I'm having to run. I'm not telling you anything that I don't do. People say to me, you know, May, it's because you're a smarty pants, it's why you're successful. No, I'm just exactly what Darwin said. I am not the smartest in the room, and I'm not the strongest. But when I was a very young girl, I learned that I had to shuck and jive. I had to change. I had to adapt. And I have found that that becomes a secret to your success, because you've got IQ, you've got EQ, but you've got AQ, and I've got a lot of CQ. So my challenge to you, every single one of you in the room, are you asleep? Are you fully adapted to your environment? Because, you know, even on boards today, we do a skills matrix, and we say, hey, we need more marketers, and we need another accountant. That's the wrong question. We should be saying to ourselves, we need people who have the ability to adapt, who can deal with quicker, faster all the time. Who are those people? And to recognize the migrant effect. AQ, EQ. So I say to you, are you brave enough to figure out who your tiger is and to pick up a rock? I end with a story. There's two guys, and you've heard this one, and they meet a tiger. And one of the guys starts putting his track shoes on, and the other guy says, what the hell are you doing? You're never going to outrun that tiger. And the guy says, yeah, but I can outrun you. And so I say to you, if you want to outrun the other guy and not get eaten, then get training. <laughs>